All right, continuing with inserts, here are some other types, the unthreaded external diameter. Now, a lot of these you'll buy something made out of uh, plastic that has uh, either this type or this type in it, where you drill a hole and then ultrasonically force the insert in, or you mold it in place. And then if you go to hang a picture or put up a shelf or something, you use these type in drywall, the little old plastic expandable type, which will hold a little bit, but not a lot. So that's the more of the industrial type inserts. Now here's another one that's made by a company called uh, uh, PEM, and it is a kind of a combination between a insert and a nut. It locks in place on the back side of the sheet and uh, bites into the edges of the hole. Now it's, these are usually used for the thin sheet where there isn't enough depth to put in an insert, but they're not, measure, they're not usually used for structural applications, critical things due to their unpredictable clinching capabilities because you don't know how it's uh, going to clinch into the surface, how much damage you'll do, and stuff like that. <coughs> now, nut plates. Uh, nut plates are sometimes called uh, anchor nuts also. Um, they're used actually as a blind nut. Uh, blind nut <coughs> is, of course, is used in an inaccessible area uh, that's why it's called blind. You can't get to it. Uh, they can be fixed or floating, and uh, they can have most of the locking and sealing features of a regular nut. And but a floating nut plate does not provide angular misalignment of fasteners. We had a case here one time that some people made that mistake. Floating nut plates only float parallel to the surface that they're mounted on, so that you can't tilt them sideways to make up for uh, misalignment. Now, uh, they're also used on a sheet that's too thin to tap. So uh, the aerospace companies use them more than anybody else because you have to drill three holes to install one. So that's a lot of labor. And uh, they're normally, here are some samples of, them, of the, the fixed type, which is just a solid one. And you drill the three holes, one for the bolt to go through into the threaded part of it, of the nut plate. Then you have two rivet holes for installing it so that it won't rotate and stays in place from now on while uh, you thread into it. Now, that's, that's the two lug type here. Here's the, the, what we always call the Mickey Mouse or corner plate. You can use those in tight corners. Here's the one lug type. That the two rivets are back here. And here's the seal type where you want to seal the thing, say if it's going to be on an airplane in a place where water would come in uh, when you were moisture or something and you wanted to seal it all together, you can uh, get them that have the sealing capability. <coughs> now the... The floating type is really the plate has slots in it, if you will, or bent up tabs here so that the threaded portion of it can slide back and forth. But as, the, as I mentioned before, it can only oscillate back and forth this way inside so it, it, it won't tilt to, uh, to take up any angular misalignment. The, the Mickey Mouse is the same way, and the one lug, and the sealed, and the replace. Here's one that has a replaceable nut, and this is, this is used some due to the fact that if you screw up the threads on one, then without drilling out the rivets and replacing the uh, nut plate, you can take this thing out and slip another one in, back in place. So those are kind of popular in some installations. Now going into the subject of threads. And that is uh, a big subject. Uh, the geometric information on threads, you can find more specs than you know what to do with an ANSI, uh, NIST, uh, Federal Standard Handbook, H28, and so on. So 
uh, I could uh, could have put a hundred pages of thread tables in here, so so I didn't didn't bother to put any of those in. So you get into the, what is common, and the most common inch threads are the UNC and UNF, Unified National Course and Unified National Fine. And then some of the others use are the UNEF, Extra Fine, UNJC, JF, and the UNR and UNK. And uh, those are maybe not the last two are not familiar with you, but uh, they are still used and in existence. And then you can have cut or ground threads where you're making a, a one-of-a-kind type uh, situation. <coughs> now, metric fasteners are available in coarse, fine, and J-threads. They're covered by ANSI and H28 specifications. But the aerospace ones, as I mentioned earlier, are covered by the NA and MA specs to uh, cover the materials and uh, geometry, plating, and everything like that to make sure that you get what you want when you order them. Now, as far as thread definitions go, we talk about uh, uh, pitch diameter, which is the center to center distance between, or pitch, I'm sorry, is the distance between threads. And of course, for the uh, English inch system, we call it threads per inch. In the uh, metric system, it is the actual distance between threads. And we have major diameter, which is the largest, largest diameter of the threads, and the minor diameter, which is root diameter, and a vanished cone, and so on. And I will have a Shortly here, we'll have a, a table that I can point all these out. Here is the crest is the top of the thread. The flank is the flat portion. Pitch diameter is the theoretical diameter where the shear thickness of mating threads is equal. And now if we go on to the table, maybe I can point these out. The pitch distance between threads is here. And here is, here's one that I want to point out while I'm here because Betsy had so much trouble getting the scanner to get this one in. This is the thread lead angle here, beta. Here is the vanish cone area here where you have incomplete threads. And the pitch diameter is this heavy line here, right there. And then you have the OD here, to the, and uh, then the flank of the thread is here, and the crest is the top of it. And there's all sorts of things on there that you probably don't even care to know about. Uh, one of the things that's a little confusing on this that I want to point out is that right here is the end of the threaded fastener that is going into the uh, internal thread, this, this part being internally threaded, just, just uh, in case it doesn't show up on your, your copy. <coughs> now, on the thread pitch and lead, of course I mentioned about the, uh, in the inch system is threads per inch, like a quarter of 20 is a quarter inch diameter with 20 threads per inch. And in the, the metric system, you might have a, say, an M8 by 1 or something like that means there's one millimeter distance uh, between threads. And then the, the, here's something, the lead of a screw thread is the distance that the nut will move forward on the screw per a one 360 degree rotation. And uh, we hassled this one a lot when we did our drafting room manual. And uh, for a single lead thread, which most of us are familiar with with fasteners, the pitch and lead are the same. But now when you want to go to a double lead, it'll move forward two threads for a 360 degree turn. And so the best way to visualize this is the thread on a milk jug or a bleach bottle or something like that where one revolution puts the lid all the way on, that's probably triple lead because the thread has more angle to it. Now for 
rolled external threads, the R in the UNRC or UNRF indicates rolled threads. And actually, this is not, this terminology is not used that much because up to about three quarter inch diameter uh, threads are rolled, uh, cold rolled by the uh, fastener manufacturers. And uh, then when you get to larger diameters, you got to have some preheating in order to roll threads. And uh, you also have to, as I mentioned earlier, way back, you have to make sure that your bolt stock is annealed prior to uh, starting to have it as soft as possible because you get cold work on the material during forming. And of course, the harder it gets, the harder it is to form. So you want to start out with it as soft as possible. And uh, here is a, an important uh, point to remember. The heat treating of commercial fasteners is usually done after all the forming operations are completed. But then when you get into the high strength stuff, it is heat treated before the threads are put on. They're cold rolled in order to increase the fatigue resistance and, uh, and actually make the thread stronger because you put residual stresses in the thread surfaces during the uh, cold working, cold rolling. Now, on UNC threads, of course, that's the most common general purpose type uh, thread. They're a little deeper than fine threads because you have a, uh, uh, since the coarser threads and the 60 degree angle between threads is the same, so you go a little bit deeper. So the minor diameter is a little bit smaller. But, uh, makes them a little bit easier to assemble without cross-threading. And of course, all just about all small fasteners are coarse thread because it's kind of hard to make a 80 threads per inch or something like that on a fastener. So anything usually up through a number eight, which is the 164 diameter, is coarse thread, uh, even in aerospace. Then uh, the uh, UNC threads, the easier to remove when they're corroded without stripping the threads. There's different schools of thought on that as to how, how much easier it is, if any, and so on. And they're uh, sloppier fit usually, although you can get them in the tighter fits. And I'll be covering the classes of fit later on. Now on the fine threads, UNF, that's kind of the standard in the aerospace industry. And nearly all fasteners with strengths above 150 KSI are UN, RF, or JF. They have a slightly larger minor diameter than the coarse thread. It gives you a little bit larger net cross-sectional area. And the smaller lead angle, since you have more threads per inch, they have a flatter angle, so it makes it a little bit easier to adjust them. The extra fine threads are used for tapped holes in thin or hard materials and uh, holes with short edge distance. Uh, they're also used on where you have adjusting screws. Uh, vernier screws for adjusting things are usually extra fine threads. But they're not used a lot in the ordinary structural fasteners. The UNR and UNK thread comparison. Now this is uh, kind of a little bit of an oddball thing. UNR threads are the same are the same as UN threads most of the time because they're all rolled, except that the root radius must be rounded. But however, people can say they've rounded the root radius, but they didn't because there's no requirement for measuring it. So if somebody says, yep, I rounded the radius on these fasteners, they may or may not have. And there is no internal UNR thread. Now, UNK threads, which is, uh, I'll have to admit, it's not kind of an oddball one, are the same as UNR threads, except that the root radius is measured in tolerance. But uh, we haven't bought any of them around here, I don't think, lately. Have we, Ron? <laughs> I didn't remember. I didn't remember buying them. Now, constant pitch threads are used a lot in larger diameters and used to tailor a design to a particular need. 
Uh, for example, when you get up into uh, fasteners larger than an inch diameter, they usually will go to constant pitch. Um, because the regular threads are hard to form, they get too big. In fact, uh, in case you ever get anything formed, any of you designers, uh, the limit, I understand it, is four threads per inch is as big a thread as you can get anywhere. And I've never seen one called out. I've seen them down to six, I believe, threads per inch. So usually what you do is go to constant pitches of eight, 12, or 16 threads per inch. That way you can roll the threads, even at uh, elevated temperatures. And it makes it a lot easier to uh, adjust the torque tension because uh, uh, you don't have to turn as hard to get the thing to move. For instance, uh, wheel pullers, bearing pullers, normally have real fine threads on them to give you that adjustment so that you can turn them without using a uh, three-foot braking bar. Uh, Left-hand threads, they do exist. In fact, uh, Chrysler used to put them on their cars for some reason or other, and people were always turning the wrench the wrong way because they'd try to tighten them uh, be tightening the threads instead of loosening them when they got a flat because they, they didn't see that somewhere on the lug it was, had an, an L stamped on it, meaning it was left hand. So there's not very many of them used. They, uh, gas grills are one of the places, gas grill, grill tanks, they use them. And on uh, turnbuckles, uh, rod ends, uh, and where the, you have left-hand nuts, usually they put some sort of a marking on them. If they're not big enough to stamp LH on them, they will put uh, notches on them or something to flag them to indicate that you do have uh, left hand. So just to make you aware of the fact that left-handed stuff does exist. Now, J-threads. The uh, J-thread is uh, made in both external and internal forms, although the internal form is a little bit dubious. And uh, they have a much larger root radius than the uh, UNF or UNC threads. And inspection of this radius is mandatory uh, if you catch them. Since the root radius is larger, the, min the minor diameter, the minimum diameter is larger, giving a higher net cross-sectional area. And it also reduces the uh, stress concentration factor in the threaded area. So normally, threads above 180 KSI uh, will be J-threads. And some nuts have J-threads that are rolled on them, but there are no J-taps for internal holes. Now, the UN. JC threads are coarse threads with the same characteristics as the UNJFs. Uh, however, they're not that common, except in the small sizes up through a number eight. Now, a J bolt requires a J nut, but a J nut will fit a regular bolt of the same size thread because the uh, radius is not that critically controlled on the nut, even though they say it is. And if you can go into the ANSI uh, B1.1 specs and all that, get all the information on the thread geometry, everything more than you care to know. Now, a tapped hole has cut threads because that's the only way you can get it formed is to cut it. So regardless of the type of thread and form that you're talking about. Internal threads. Internal threads are cut with some sort of a tap. Uh, although you can, you can roll some on, on the nuts, they do have capabilities for rolling them. But uh, the tapped holes are harder to inspect than an external thread. Uh, external, so their design margin should be higher to allow for that. Because really, if you want to uh, check an internal thread and you want to measure the root radius or something like that, about the only way to do it is use uh, there's a dental plaster that you can put in there that is soft enough. Like, for instance, if you get an, uh, you probably got the uh, impression at some time for a bridge or something like that for your, for your mouth, they use a soft type of plaster that will maintain the configuration, but you can strip it out. 
Well, they use stuff like that to check internal threads where they need to check them. So, uh, but that's a lot of trouble to uh, take the mix the stuff up, get yourself a cast of it, and then use an optical comparator to measure it. So it's usually not done. And uh, there is no J thread for tapped holes, as I mentioned there earlier. Now, thread classes or FIPS. Uh, this is a, the, the number associated with these is uh, associated with a tolerance band. So the, the one, the class one type thread would be the, the nut and bolt you buy from the hardware store and you put the nut on the bolt and you can jiggle it back and forth because it's a sloppy a fit. That would be a class one. Uh, class three, class two is the industrial grade. Class three is the aerospace grade where the thing fits uh, quite snug. And uh, the uh, aerospace industry uses primarily the class three threads. Now you can uh, go into H28, federal standard H28 or the SAE handbook or ANSI specs and so on and you can find out what the uh, tolerance levels are for each one of these threads for a given class, if you're so inclined. Cut or ground threads, are, they're normally made on a one-of-a-kind fastener for a specific application. So, uh, but remember that tapped holes are cut so that uh, you can't cold form threads very well in a tapped hole. So cut threads are weaker than roll threads, and thread cutting destroys the grain flow in the uh, piece of material. Now, uh, this is one of the reasons why your super strength bolts have forged heads, because you have to maintain the proper grain flow in the uh, head to shank area in order to cut down on the stress concentration. Now for metric threads, once again, to refresh your memory on them, they're usually described as a M and then the diameter like an M8 times the pitch, whatever it is. Uh, and the example I've given there is that one, I believe, is a, that's fine thread for an eight uh, millimeter diameter. And the, the pitch value tells whether the thread is coarse or fine, but it, there's no designation like an MC or an MF to indicate whether it's fine or coarse. So, so uh, if you're unfamiliar with metric threads, about the only way to tell is go look it up in a table. Uh, to see whether you have fine or coarse threads. The only further identifier on the metric is a J, where you have J threads. So, uh, and remember also that the property class of the material has to be specified to tie down the strength requirements. So, so just don't call out an M8 by, by one and say that's the end of it. You gotta also give a property class to tie down the strength. Now a metric, thread classes, they have two diameter tolerances, which is kind of seemed odd to me, but uh, nevertheless, that's the way they do it. First one is for pitch diameter, and the second one is for crest diameter, which is the major diameter for external thread and the minor diameter for internal thread. Now, if you only give one value, they're uh, applying the same tolerances to both uh, crest and pitch. If they give two values, you have then two, two different tolerance levels for the two of them. Now, their numbers go from three to nine on, on the tolerance levels, with four to six being the normal range for the tolerances. And they give letter number values for the pitch and crest diameters where they have different tolerances. Now, I think this is the next, no, I'm sorry, it'll be the one after this. 
Uh, on the, uh, you have sample callouts given in the ANSI Y14.6. And uh, on our next table, which you can go ahead and go to, Alice, we have the, uh, a, we have some uh, sample callouts here. This would be a way of calling these out, and you can read them in your handout. I'm not sure whether you can read them any, anywhere else. <laughs> but now, notice on the pitch diameter here, you have a 4H, and on the major diameter, you have a 6H. So you have two different levels of tolerance on them. Now if you come down to the other one down here in the uh, below where you have the internal thread, you have a 4H and 5H for your pitch and diameter tolerance. So with the metric, it is, uh, you have to really pay attention to what what you're calling out because to me it's more confusing and then of course uh, on that slide there was also a single number given there of six I believe somewhere along the line no it's the next one <coughs> that has a, has a six on it where you have the same tolerances on both the pitch and minor diameter so th this next one it gives you also a uh, a way of calling it out and an explanation here on the left on the external, internal, and so on. And uh, one of the things they have added there, which we will be covering later on, are the methods of inspection. The systems 21 and 22 and 23 gauging systems. When we go into inspection and acceptance of fasteners, we'll, we'll cover those. Moving on, here is a comparison, and to me, this is a, a nice thing to have because it, it kind of gives you a, uh, a yardstick to measure from. On the comparison of inch to metric on the thread tolerances. Now, somebody asked me the other day about what would be a class one in metric. See, I don't have a one on there. I just have the two, two and three. And I think it's an E classification in the uh, t tolerances because uh, metric usually does not uh, come with that classification. It's, it's normally either the, uh, the, uh, the six is usually about uh, what they, they call out for it. And uh, so uh, I think it's an E. But anyway, if you go into the ANSI specs, they give the tolerance bands in there. And I, I think that uh, that is the one. If you, uh, IFI puts out a uh, manual or a book on uh, metric fasteners that has all of the different ANSI stuff in there. So anyway, that, that is something you can refer back to. Now here's for thread relief. Uh, I put this in here because it's something that is quite common to have a thread relief, particularly on what the shoulder bolt that we'll be covering next. But uh, this diameter on the thread relief uh, should not be larger than the minor diameter of the thread, or you get in trouble when you try to thread it. And the uh, sometimes in a tapped hole, you even put in internal thread relief where you don't want to kind of run your tap in there and have incomplete threads and all sorts of notches and gouges and everything like that. So you have uh, thread relief where you, when you tap through, at least it will come out clean. Since thread relief was a part of a shoulder bolt uh, designation, I went ahead and put in a shoulder bolt here. Now, uh, they can be used as an actuator pin when you're uh, tightening the shoulder up against the surface to tighten it up, and then using this big shank for an actuator pin. 
Uh, they're used some in disc brakes installation on cars. On some of them you use a uh, shoulder bolt to tighten them down because you want to have a, a loose fit on the shank and a tight fit so they lock tight them in with the, this uh, threaded area here. The only thing is a shoulder bolt is uh, real bad if you ha put it in single shear because this reduced cross section here has a high stress concentration on it if you go into bending. So uh, it will bend very easily there. So you got to be careful to make sure the top part of it near the head is supported when you're using it. Now for tap threads, uh, I don't know, probably a lot of you uh, shade tree mechanics have done thread tapping. And uh, uh, you got to do it carefully to get the proper thread with the correct alignment. And this means you got to usually tell you, if you're doing it yourself, what size drill to use, drill the hole with. And then the problem is to start that tap by hand and get it to go in properly so you don't wind up with something lopsided. Well, of course, on machines, you can get away from that. But uh, sometimes on uh, critical applications, they actually have to drill a hole and then ream it to get it to exactly the right diameter for tapping. And of course, the required length of a tapped hole is dependent on the hardness of the material and the tensile load developed by the ins installed fastener. And uh, one of the key things here that you got to think of, too, is the length should be based on complete threads. Because when you start out, you don't have complete threads, and you don't wind up with complete threads at the bottom. So we have a, an example here of the different types of uh, taps. Here, you start out by drilling a hole with a tap drill. Then you use a tapered tap, which has a whole bunch of incomplete threads on it. In fact, seven to 10 of them are incomplete. This gives you something that you can start better. Then you have a plug tap here, which has an intermediate one that has fewer incomplete threads. And then if you have to make the uh, hole tap all the way down, then you use a bottom tap or a flat bottom tap here to tap it down to where you only have about one incomplete thread. Now, my, uh, my brother is a retired millwright, and he said that when they got them at the steel mill, they usually got them in sets of three like that so that you could start out with your tapered one to start the hole and then go to the other two to finish it up so that you'd wind up with a decent tapped hole. So we will pause here and uh, resume on threads after the break.